pretty conscious of other recovery modalities, like our movement outside of training and our sleep. But I think just that like extra bit you go into, it's like, yeah, maybe not everything we do is based in health. Maybe it's just about getting more weight on the bar or performing that bit better. Um, so I would wonder, do you think the evidence is always reflective of, might be good advice, you know, for your mom, your sister, your brother, your uncle, but is it good advice for you? Yeah, you know, everything works until it doesn't. Mm. And I think with the topic of the minimum sort of effective dose, that's going to change person to person. And the minimum effective dose that you require a powerlifter versus a bodybuilder will be different. And as you progress over the years, will be different too. But even at that though, like, like why would you want to train so minimally all the time? Mm. Do you know what I mean? Not like, especially for the bro lifters, they want to be, you know, hammering their whatever ladder raises and boys have girls and everything else. So you're, you're going to sprinkle in a few bits mm. on top of that as well. And, you know, you have to take the literature with a pinch of salt sometimes mm -hmm. and, you know, apply it to yourself as well. So, yeah. Yeah. I think, and I think that is it, isn't it? It's like, because with that, the evidence that we have or the research that's being done might not necessarily be reflective of what you're specifically going for, you know? Like, uh, I would imagine any, like, evidence-based dietitian would probably have a heart attack if they looked at your carbohydrate intake, you know? Yeah, you know, in theory, you know, like a dietitian, they should understand, you know, people that ha will have different energy demands you know I'm, I, I would consider myself quite active you know I am heavier as well I'm like 250 odd pounds now man you're fucking huge now <laughs> you're huge now yeah man. I'm, I'm probably carrying a bit more you know body fat then I probably would like but at the end of the day the goal is absolute strength yeah. right now you know that will shift in a couple of weeks time you mm -hmm. know um and you know we go through the different phases as well so when you're in the off season when you're you know probably cutting a bit of body fat mm -hmm. your volume may look a lot different to when you're say you know, 12 weeks out versus again, four weeks out, your volume's tapering down, the intensity is up. So, um, yeah, the, those minimum effect dose requirements do tend to change a bit yeah. over time, you know. Uh, I, I did, no, I noticed that though, there was one day, I can't remember what it was, one Sunday. I don't know what it was. You just walked in, I was like, fucking hell, Ryan's after getting huge. Because like, you're, you're, you're bigger than me anyway, you know what I mean? But like, it was noticeable at one stage, like you were just fucking massive. Like, did you have like a, I think you made a post uh, maybe at one stage last year, it could be ages ago, but it stuck with me. We were talking about you were constantly trying to cut and like maintain a certain weight and you found you know, like you were picking up niggles, aches and pains, getting sick and things like that. Was there like a conscious decision or was there a turning point where you were like, you know, fuck it, I'm going to I'm gonna commit to this and get big as strong as possible? Yeah, so for me, it was sort of my early years growing up when I first started getting into the gym. Um, I, I'm from Blanchestown and at the time in the original West Side and in Animal Barbell, there was a lot of, you know, bodybuilders and, you know, influencers and everything else at the time. They were loving, you know, staying lean year yeah. round. And as well, I was watching a lot of like Joey D, Rob Lipset, Matt August, who yeah. in theory, they, they're always lean, you know, and I sort of based my ideas off that. So I wanted to stay aesthetic and shredded. And Dave Lade's another name as well that pops up all yeah. sort of Gymshark athletes and uh, my protein boys. Um, so, yeah, I just sort of wanted to stay lean and, and I had a sort of bad, I don't know, I wouldn't call it a bad body image. I just didn't want to pile on too much body fat because I liked being lean. Yeah. Um, and you paired that up with the celiac disease as well. I tried to actually, you know, push a lot of food. I was eating probably similar enough calories to what I'm eating now mm -hmm. when I was an 80 kilo lifter right. and I wasn't gaining weight simply because I couldn't fucking digest it. Yeah. Was, my body was just rejecting it and shitting it out. Um, but no, eventually, I think it was in 2021, um, was a big turning point for me. I was like, right, I need to commit to getting bigger. And I was, I was, I started following Julian Smith. I don't yeah, know if you know him. I do, yeah. yeah, he's, he mentioned, I seen a post he put up. He's like, he had a bulk for six years straight of just adding size. And he was like, if you want to, you know, maximize your growth potential, I don't know. Mm. Now, six years seems to be quite a long time. I probably wouldn't recommend that for everyone, you know, yeah. but uh, he was like a prolonged bulk is probably the best way you can go about it rather than going through constant cutting and bulking cycles all the time. You know, you may need to just commit for a lengthy period of time to gain. Mm. Now, there is nuances within that. It's, you know, you might pile on a bit more body fat, which may not be ideal, but, mm. you know, it's it's a good idea to just try different things, I, I suppose. Well, given your experience, so we'll get tr through some of you, like your history, you mentioned your celiac disease. I'll talk to you a little bit more about that later on. But I want to ask about, so right now you're a coach with Abs Nutrition. So you help a wide variety of athletes achieve their body composition goals, weight making goals for uh, weight class sports and things like that. 
Would you say, and this is something I've noticed with the younger lifters I work with, there is this reluctance almost to get, like, they're like, I want to be bigger and stronger, but I also want to be lighter and leaner. So you've got these two, like, opposing goals. So there's an analogy Connor Campbell has used when he's been on here before. It's chase two rabbits, you lose both. So what's the usual, I assume you've encountered that firstly. Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. I I work with guys who they want to get leaner and they either want to stay in a weight class, say under 93, for example, but yeah. they sit at 96 and they don't, they don't want to commit to 105 just yet, even though committing to 105 is probably the better thing yeah. for them to do. Um, but no, I think it's just about trying to keep your performance at a good spot mm. for a time. And then when it hits a wall, you know, you're not progressing anymore, maybe then consider going up. But if you're, if you're still able to progress in the weight class you're in, rather than stalling for, you know, mm. months or even years on end in some cases, um, yeah, then maybe it might be a better idea to go up, you know. Mm. I think as well, what people can look, sometimes maybe they're not, they're missing is that you could go up for a while. You know, you don't necessarily have, because I've had this conversation recently with one, a lifter that I have, this, it's female lifter, really reluctant to go up a weight class. But I'm like, you're sitting kind of between these two. So why not just, instead of like being at this constant, like gain taining or cutting, you know what I mean? Let's just embrace being in the heavier weight class for a while. Let's get fucking really, really strong. See what your body composition looks like. And the likelihood is if you ever did want to cut into the lower weight class, even if it's for more body composition stuff outside of powerlifting, you'll probably find that, yeah, you might not necessarily have that top end strength you've developed, let's say as an under 76, as an under 69, but you'll probably still be stronger than you were last time you were kind of like riding the fence. That's where I find myself now. I was, I think I was just saying to you outside, I've decided to go up to the 105s for nationals this year. And that's the main motivator, man. Like I was like, look, I've been in this fucking weight class for a little while now. And particularly now, like I'm leaning down for Western Euros. We're about lifting there in about 10 days. Probably <laughs> this podcast will probably be out just after we've lifted. Um, so hopefully it's gone well for both of us anyway. Yeah. But uh, I, not, I was like, right. I'm sitting, like, I feel like I'm getting very lean, but I'm, like, it, I have to, like, get more lean than I would like. That's going to start impacting performance. And even in terms of, like, leverages, like, I find, like, I have to get really tight on the belt to get enough of a brace. Um, and I'm, like, getting, like, visible abs, which is all cool. Like, the striations and things are fucking sick, but they don't help with powerlifting. So I'm like, right, it's obviously a sign that I'm probably carrying more muscle now, which is good. It's a great thing. So I'm probably better off going into more of a growth phase for the next, say, like, year, 18 months of just embracing being, like, I'll probably naturally sit around 96, 97 and then grow as time goes on. Uh, was that, like, did you find that? Did you find yourself sitting between two weight classes when you were at that point where like, look, I need to commit like commit to gaining and I'll become competitive later. Like what was, was there like, because I, I think that's what most people worry about, isn't it? They're like, what if I'm not competitive up a weight class? Yeah, I think this is a big thing as well. The whole comparison is the, the Tifa Joy thing. You're looking at these lifters who are really good in the country and online on social media and you see them lifting way more than you in a weight class or two lighter than you, you know? Yeah. Um, that can deter you from ultimately gaining weight because you think you can be yeah. just like them. But what people don't realize is that you know, these top level lifters have spent these years building muscle and, mm -hmm. you know, dialing in their technique and building up these skills that allow them to stay in that weight class mm -hmm. and, and the habits to do so. Um, but yeah, for me, it was, I was, I think it was actually, it was during my Odyssey days, I joined them when I was in around the 90 kilo mark yeah. uh, during COVID and I was around, yeah, 90 kilos got up to around 90 eight odd before I decided to to fully commit to being 105. I was like, I want to cut to 93 for last chance. Mm. And uh, Nathan Keenan, who was my coach at the time, he was like, look, you'll be better off moving up. And I spoke with Adam as well um, about that. And they they helped me to commit to 105. Um, and yeah, my lifts just sort of skyrocketed then, you know. Mm. And you mentioned about the, the whole sort of pain side of things and being leaner and just being more comfortable shifting heavier loads. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's the same for myself. You know, I find I'm, I've way less niggles. My knees, mm. I used to always have really sore knees. It'd take me a while to warm up. Uh, even just like my my shoulder, my right shoulder, it's always the right shoulder. Um, my back as well. I've had, you know, very bad back injuries before. Mm. You know, all of that stuff seems to be pretty much gone now. I get the odd sort of, you know, bit of tightness before I train, but that tends to go away. But uh, yeah, it's way, way less now. That yeah. I've, you know, committed to being a bit heavier and holding a bit more fat mass, as you'd say. Yeah, but I think that's it, isn't it? And it, People often hear these cliches. It's like you at your most aesthetic is not necessarily you that performs the best and your best perform, like you at your best performance is not necessarily 
the most comfortable you're ever going to be in your skin. And I think that's the dichotomy, particularly when we talk about like natural powerlifting. You know, you're going to have these two conflicting goals. And uh, I suppose like it depends on what your priority is in the moment and maybe not letting your emotions affect it. I would agree as well. I think my most productive training cycle was post-Nationals 2023. I committed to just like training heavier for a while because I wasn't planning to compete for a while. Um, and I was fucking, man, particularly squats, I was fucking popping off. I was having a great time. I talk about it a couple of times on this podcast. Such a good block. I remember Andrew Rowe texting me being like, man, what the fuck are you doing for your squats? I was like, I'm just fatter, man. It's class. Uh, and then I got the invite to Westerns last year. Uh, very, very close to the meet. I had about eight weeks. and had a lot of weight to lose. Thank fuck for Shane's story. He got me there. But uh, have you then, in this period of time that you've committed to going up the weight class uh, and being sitting that bit heavier? Because I will say, your training looks class. Like, you're <laughs> repping really, really big weights. You know what I mean? And I... I definitely think that's watching you has made it more comfortable for me to commit. I will say like, just as an aside, and it's part of the reason I've been harassing you to come on the podcast for a while (laughs) because you're somebody who like, I definitely pay attention to your training. There's a couple of lifters. I pay attention to yourself, Keen Madden, Toaster, Alex, these lads that like, I see as like, you know, in and around that like skill level that I'm looking at, like, what are they doing to progress that I'm not doing? What are the, what are the boxes they're ticking that I'm not? Alex and Toaster committed to going up weight classes. You've committed to going up weight class. Keen hasn't yet, but Keen's fucking unbelievable. So yeah. let's, let's be real. Like he's he's probably not someone to be comparing yourself to because he's just world class. You know what I mean? But uh was the, have you had days where you're like, man, I'm a fat piece of shit? <laughs> yeah, man. Like right now, <laughs> I'm I'm probably a bit heavier body fat than I would like to be. You know, it's it's actually sort of quite a bit of a paradox as well, because I'm sort of coaching a lot of guys mm. to get leaner and get ripped where I'm sort of just sitting at, you know, 20% body fat. And mm. um it does play a toll on your mental but you have to remember you know you have this goal um of being your absolute strongest and you know even though that is the opposite of being lean and you know maybe a bit weaker you have to sort of commit to that and get that over like you don't have to stay it that way forever you know yeah there'll be different phases different goals um the best thing to do is just commit full on Mm. as you said chase two rabbits catch an eater you know if you're trying to stay lean and and um get stronger you know it, it may not be the, the best thing or the most ideal scenario so mm. like you mentioned you were trying to stay sort of 93 but then you moved up yeah you notice you did get stronger and that's the same thing like alex elliot he's been in a, a surplus now for for god knows how long since moving yeah. up from 83 and his you know his bench alone is skyrocketing even his yeah. squat he's, he's repping his old comp max he is, yeah. and easily as well easily as well and you his know. neck is slowly disappearing as he walks <laughs> around just more bigger and bigger and bigger yeah, you know, in Toaster, he sits around, you know, 98 to 100 mm. before, you know, cutting into 93. And, uh, you know, it's just having that constant feel there and the energy yeah. to actually recover and build more mass to be able to tolerate those heavy loads. Mm. And and I think you, you mentioned earlier on, and I do next want to talk a little bit about what got you into lifting, but you were talking about some of the, like, some of the influences you would have had when you were first getting into lifting, like you mentioned, like Matt August and things like that, like so YouTubers from back in the golden age, of YouTube fitness. I think that's kind of like died a little bit, which is kind of a shame. Like I remember, did you ever watch Physiques of Greatness, Chris Jones, the the big, huge black dude? No, I think that was sort of just before. Yeah. Maybe he was still around when I started, but no, I, I never he, did. He no. ended up starting his own brand then, uh, Pump Chasers. He's unbelievable. But he, I watched him and I watched Elliot Hulse. Do you know Elliot Hulse? Yes. He did like strongman and things like that. So I think Chris is like a bodybuilder, but he would talk a lot about like, he'd go through like bulking and cutting and he'd get like really pudgy and he'd like bulk and then he'd get shredded lean. And so like, all right, you fucking do it. Like, you know, and then Elliot was always about like performance. So I think I was lucky in that way that I kind of had a little element of that. Like, yeah, being lean is is cool, but being able to lift heavy things is is even better. I actually think it's only in the last couple of years with with swapping over to lifting in the Irish PF from doing primarily ab series. I think that's what kind of like gaslit me into being in weight classes. You know what I mean? Because before I was like, I just want to lift the most weight. Um, When you started in the gym, the day one you walked in, was it to be like, like, I just want to be jacked and lean? Or did you have have an attraction to strength training as well? No, I, I... Didn't even really know what powerlifting was at the time. Mm. Um, I was around, you know, 76 kilos. I played football yeah. um, I've, for Castanock Celtic uh, for years. And I just seen a couple of my mates were, you know, getting a bit bigger from going to the gym. Mm. And I actually went uh, to the the local hotel gym, Castanock Hotel Gym with, with two of my mates. Oh, class. <laughs> Sam and Steve. And yeah, they brought me uh, for the first time. We tra- think we trained arms. And then mm. for about three days after, my arms were just swollen. Yeah. Like my body was like, what the fuck is going on here? And I couldn't actually bend my arms. It was like a T-Rex. And uh, 
I thought I had just gotten bigger all of a sudden. I was like, this is class. This is easy. I'm going to, you know, try to keep doing this. But the reality was it was just a bit of, you know, inflammation. And then it went down yeah. after a few days. But it wasn't until another, you know, few years after that, that I actually fully committed to going to the gym. And um, when I was in college in Minute, uh, I just started using the, the gym on campus because yeah. it was convenient and it was free. So I just went in. I was just trying out different machines. No structure whatsoever. Um, the goal was to just get bigger though and another one of my mates uh, Thomas who's I'm still good mates with now mm. he said to me which still applies to this day he was like just go Jim and he fucking loads yep. and that, those are the basic principles you know um, in theory obviously there's a lot more to it than that but um, those those two basic principles of yeah. what guided me to where I am now and it's stuck with me since then you know mm. so. I, I love that like uh, I did that as well you just like a friend of mine gave me a program when I started and I did it for like a couple of weeks but then for a while I was like I'm just going to fucking try everything. I just want to see what everything does. And I think you kind of just get get caught in that little, like, I want to, like, fuck around. You know what I mean? And look, I think people will obviously argue, yeah, you're going to make more progress following a plan. But I think there's, like, that nice little air when you're, like, a complete noob to the gym and just kind of figuring things out. Uh, do you remember the first time you got under a bar to squat or anything like that? Oh, to squat? I, could, I can't recall. But I know for a fact that it was in minute anyways. And, right. you know, definitely wasn't hitting depth. Because I, I had seen the likes of, you know, I started following all the, you know, the big guys and, you know, buff dudes as well. Yeah. They're or just YouTube. It's like, what's the five best exercises to build muscle and get strong? Mm. And there was talk about squat, bench, deadlift, of course. Mm -hmm. I think it was like barbell rows and maybe overhead press overhead as well. Press, yeah, yeah. So I started implementing a load of those. Um, so I went in, I was doing, you know, squats some days then hitting legs. And then it would, I based it around like a push-pull leg split then. Oh, and, yeah. and I was going, you know, six days a week. Would squeeze in the odd seven day where I could. I became obsessed with it quite quickly. Mm. And then within six months towards the end of the, the football season, I was like, right, I can actually, you know, commit to this on my own sort of timetable rather than having, you know, the set training days with the team. Yeah. Um, so it was a, it was a tough enough decision to leave football, but you know, years on and obviously hindsight now, it mm. was uh the, the right decision at the time, you know, because I needed a part-time job when I was in college. And, you know, training and having football on the weekend sort of took away from that. I didn't have a lot of time to work. So, um, yeah, the money and everything else came into play. So, yeah, but, uh, that, that's it, isn't it? You know, you got to get you got to make the money and the muscle, you know what I mean? That's, that's the job, it, man. You just got to get after it. You know, you have yeah, big decisions to make. But it's funny because I was captain of the team at the time. Right. And, OK. And, and that year, yeah, uh, I think we were the under 19s. We were in the NDSL Premier League mm. and we actually went on to win the league that year. And, uh, you know, it was sort of bittersweet ending, you know, it, was, it came at the right time though, you know, we had just won the league. So finish on a high. Yeah, hang off the boots, finish on a high. And, uh, you know, since then they've been angling, oh, when are you coming back and everything else? I was like, I'm probably not as quick as I used to be, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'd probably be still a decent centre half, you know, at the probably size. Probably rugby more now at the size, yeah. Yeah, I get that a good bit as well. You know, how do you play rugby? Do you, uh, or, you know, you make a good prop and everything else, mm. but, uh, uh, you know, I just say, no, I just lift weights. And they're like, really? And, yeah, fucking dead right, man. Listen, look. <laughs> This is the sport for unathletic people, right? This is what we do. Yeah. But uh, well, I imagine then even socially, though, that was like a big shift because obviously you had all your mates like that. You said you were captain of the team. So to like, as you say, hang up the boots and then kind of shift focus to this thing. I'm sure you're still mates with all the lads, but you're, you know, you're not putting on the jersey every week. You know what I mean? It, it is a little bit different. So when did you go from training in like the college gym to join an animal barbell? Yeah, so... I think it was that that's the same year. So I started lifting weights in the college gym around the, the January or February. Yeah. Um, and then I'd say in the November of that year, I think it was over, no, it was over the summer actually because right. the college was closed. We were off. So I was like, right, I need to join a, a gym. So I joined Westside, the, the first Westside. Yeah. And then I think over the years, then it was just sort of hopping between Animal Barba and Westside. They're literally around the corner from each other mm. um, and just alternating between the two. Yeah, so. and animal barbell was like has like that's mad. Like I think there's a lot of lifters now that have no idea what it is, but what a like bizarre place. Yeah. Uh, where, do you know the guy that owned it? Like now this is only alleged, but he used to like steal, fabricate his own equipment. He likes to make stuff. Yeah, Voidus. Yeah, I think yeah. he. Um, yeah, I think he got it. He either made it himself or else he, he got it made. And like that's that's amazing. Like, and that, the, the equipment was fucking savage. It was yeah. like old school equipment, and I remember you know trying to search for similar machines in other gyms as well. And yeah. I don't know, it was, the place was decked out and it was a good powerlifting scene as well. So yep. it was it was good for they everyone. They did, they hosted, was it WRPF? They did, yeah. And you that, lifted it there, didn't you? Yes, that's how I got into it. So I was sort of following my own sort of powerlifting plans. I, I, I downloaded sort of free 
uh, programs from you know the likes of David Lade yeah. or ones I'd find the line just 12, 12 week ones or I also ran August 753 which was oh, amazing it was basically 531 but yeah. he threw in it was basically each day was a set lift so you'd have like a 7x5 5x7 five or 10x3 mm. on either squat bench deadlift or your overhead press and I fucking put on a load of size and strength just following that sort of yeah. structure and uh then eventually, then they seen I had decent sort of SPD in Animal Barbell and they were sort of edging me to do the competition. And I was like, oh, I don't know, I don't know. It's, it's, it's in three weeks, I don't have a lot of time. They're like, oh, I'll just do it for the crack. So I did it. Um, I was, I competed in the under 82 and a half class. <laughs> class. <laughs> and I think I, I sat at 85 or 86 at the time. Yeah. And then I did like a water cut. So I, I cut to like 81.5 one or maybe 1.7 1. 7 or something and i was like paper thin like i was shredded at the yeah. time and uh, i competed went seven for nine in my first comp i competed with you know wraps in knee wraps without a belt i think i've seen a video is there a video yeah i looked like, quite gaunt yeah. <laughs> so, but um no i did well enough i got like a 180 squat um a 120 bench and then a 225 deadlift or something amazing for your first meet like, yeah. yeah it wasn't too bad like it was yeah. on especially with the weight bar. yeah like yeah, yeah, it's not too bad. Like when you compare the, you know, strength versus size ratio. So yeah, I definitely think there was something lost on animal barbell clothes, man. Because that was such a like. I think you had to. Exp- like, I never trained there like regularly, but done a couple of day passes when you were still going. Was Grill Town still beside it? The little place that made the food. Yeah, I think that's still there now. Yeah, ah, class. Yeah. yeah, I used to go in there after, and th- it was so funny because the guy at the at the counter that was serving you, if he knew you'd been in the gym, he was so sound. But if you thought you were just a random, he was such an unbelievable prick. <laughs> it was so strange. But uh, ah, like that's like, this is like a, a bizarre thing. I'm not sure if like you've, you've witnessed this. And maybe if you've worked with a couple of the juniors. But it's so strange to see how like culture changes and the scene changes and people's awareness of things changes. Like So like there's people like that lifting abs and on the scene now that don't know who Barry Piggott is or Brown and McPeak. And yeah. I think that's mad. Or, like there's li- people now that will talk about like great gyms in Ireland that didn't, they never, were never an animal barbell. Um, so let me ask then just with that road in history back, was it around this time then or was it later that you decided to join Odyssey Strength? So Animal Barbell um, became Fire Gyms. Yeah. You know, shut down. I'm not too sure why. Um, and yeah, it became Fire. I was training in Fire and then just as Fire opened, yeah, uh, COVID struck. Everything shut down. Yeah. And then I'm fairly sure I joined Odyssey. Yeah, so it was just before um fire had shut down mm. um yeah nathan reached out to me and he, he offered me coaching i said yeah happy days and yeah we just ran a, like a strip down my volume completely you know that you know the odyssey sort of bottoms up yeah. periodization approach and yeah we ran that and again it was like another sort of turning point in my lifting it was mm. like august 7.3 was one where i made a lot of progress it sort of stalled for a bit and then joining odyssey was another one where i just sort of seen a, a big growth spurt as well yeah. I think that's a, it's a good approach for coaching. It's definitely something I notice whenever people, if they've been in powerlifting and then they start with me, it's always a case of they're doing so much. And it's like, do you need to do that much to respond? And then it becomes the trick of, and you've probably dealt with this yourself from coaching people. It's that if people hit the volume really hard at the beginning, it's like, where do you go from here? You know what I mean? Like if you've already, if you're already doing 20 plus sets of bench a week, it gets very hard to add more. Whereas if we start with enough that you're going to respond, we can add more as a block goes on. And then like, you know, next block, we can bring the rep count down, bring the intensity up. You know what I mean? It gives us more room to play with. So you obviously found that beneficial then when you start working with Nathan, like pull him back a little bit, led to bigger gains down the road. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, actually, funny enough, there's a bit of a gap there in the in the timeline. So I, I finished college and then I went to Trinity to do a master's and then yeah. I was training with the Trinity Barbell lads. I realized they oh, had yeah, a yeah. they had a powerlifting club. I was like, oh deadly. So um and this is when I was prepping for my second meet in the WRPF. Mm-hmm. And they told me to come down and we went to abs and they were all running like a you know the ab system. The old ab system was like you know six by seven close grip on a Tuesday yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and lots of volume. So it was yeah it was, it was heaps of volume at the time. And then going from that to you know the Odyssey approach was a bit of a change. So I saw you know a good bit of growth in abs and then pulling back the volume then was also beneficial to yeah. me. So, you know, it's it's almost like both work. Oh, they do. Yeah, for sure. You know, because I think that's that's what they say, isn't it? Like, uh, is it, 
everything can work, but not necessarily all of the time. You know what I mean? Or it'll work until it doesn't, you know? Exactly, yeah. 100% of the time it works, 60% of the time, whatever that phrase is, you know? But I think that's it. And it's like that we adapt to things so quickly. Sometimes you do need to change. But I will say as well, I think that like, that was like, a, I've talked to Adam on here about it. I've talked to Jay on here about it. There was this like weird animosity between these clubs that existed for a <laughs> while. Remember, yeah. And it's funny that over time, I think they've taken things from each other. Like I think, I remember, I remember when I was in abs and there was a real resistance using RPE as a, as a, as a metric. We did like almost everything as a percentage. Um, and then like, as time went on, Jay did get more like, uh, like, yeah, look, maybe this system does work. It's good to get like a bit of auto regulation for the lifters to kind of gauge where they're at. Cause you can't judge everything visually. And you know, you can all, you could, you don't necessarily need to absolutely hammer squat bench deadlift. if we can make up a lot of the volume and some non-specific work. But then I think a lot of the Odyssey coaches have gone, you know what, maybe throwing in a few accessories here and there isn't going to do the lifters any harm because people also like to be a bit jacked. You know what I mean? So I think you've actually seen this like balancing out. And I would agree with this statement because I've Adam said it on here to me before. He was like, 90% of the powerlifting program is pretty much all the same. And it's only those 10% differences. And then the coach's approach that really changes it. Have you found that in your experience going between the two? Yeah, absolutely. You know, as you said, everything works until it doesn't. And I yeah. think... Uh, Andrew Blackwood said it well when he was on this podcast he said that you know if you apply enough efforts to pretty much any approach it will work you know yeah. I've tried multiple programs over the years high volume low volume high frequency low frequency and they all essentially work and uh, you know it's important as well to do keep an open mind mm. to other approaches because yeah. you know you can take something from it and you can actually you know potentially get benefit from it as well you know mm. I try not to be so close minded saying no this is the way which I can be at times. I've, I've opened my mind to a lot more different things, even in nutrition as well. Um, but no, you can take something from everything, even from the old Westside barbell methods as yeah. well, you know, and the more science-based stuff as well, which I know can get a bad rap, but uh, <laughs> no, it, it's definitely... Instagram yeah. can make a meme out of anything, man. Yeah, absolutely. What's yeah. Uh, what's like a hot take you used to have on nutrition? Oh, let me think now. That'll probably take me a minute or two. I don't know. I'd say, you know, that you need to completely ban alcohol. I used mm. to be a stickler for this with my clients, especially when I just sort of started out as a coach. Yeah, how did that go down in Ireland? <laughs> yeah, you know, like people aren't going to take alcohol out of life. I was like mm. telling them, you know, this is the reason why you're not making sort of fat loss progress. But it was really just me not being able to fully understand them as a person, you know, why they're, you know, maybe drinking, what their social life is like, but also not being able to sort of plan mm. around the weekends and, and yeah. make room for that stuff as well. And just being able to teach people, you know, I lacked the, the experience as a coach at the time, yeah. um, which over time I developed through doing the nutrition courses um, and just working with people mm. and, you know, figuring them out and what may work better for them, you know? Yeah. I used to be a stickler for everybody having to train with a bar. Everybody had to learn a bar. Like when I started, when I started coaching, everyone needed to learn to squat bench and deadlift. Like I was... Like I will ask, there's a residual element of this still in 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 me today. Whereas like the par the barbell is the best piece of equipment in the gym for everything. Right now, obviously, I realize that's not true. Right now, you know. But at the time, my logic was is that if you all, everything you do on the bar is essentially the hardest version of the skill. Right, squat with a bar is going to be significantly harder than a hack squat machine, but it's going to be harder than a leg press. Right, that's just fact. But then, so I was like, right, if you learn to back squat first, everything else gets easier. I still think an element of that that's true. However, I also realized that as soon as like, man, I just want bigger fucking legs. I'm like, maybe you don't need to squat the bar then. Yeah, you know, depending on how you squat as well, mm. you might get more quad involvement. Exactly. Might not. And yeah, I, I was the same. Mm. I was telling all my mates who were more sort of bodybuilding focused yeah. uh, at the time. They would have all trained the barbell as well that you need to be squatting, bench and deadlift. Like a lot of people, they would avoid deadlifts. Yeah. Um, just because, you know, the, the fatigue toll and everything else and you don't need it to build a big back. But um. Yeah, I think that that sort of opened my mind a bit as well. You don't actually need the, you know, the big three to build muscle, but yeah. definitely fun to build strength and especially fun to sort 100%. of get into powerlifting as well. I, I also think is that like, is that's one now I've seen, like obviously the, the fatigue to stimulus ratio of deadlifts, right? I get it, but deadlifts are good crack. Like, you know what I mean? There's, there's, I think you're kind of, I'm not saying everyone needs to deadlift, but like, I think like, 
even like a block pull or something like that is fine. But I think there's something nice about just lifting a big heavy weight off the floor. You know what I mean? It's a cool skill to have. I'm not saying everyone needs to do it. And I get if people are like, you know, prepping for a bodybuilding show, maybe it's not worth it because they're fucking cutting as well. So they're going to be fucked. Um, but like, yeah, man, deadlifts are, are good. Like your deadlifts are actually flying at the moment. What you pulled the other day? Three, was it three something? Three seventeen? Uh, in June Open. That's or, June Open. You pulled. You've had a big deadlift, but did you not hit a nice double or, or triple or something recently? Yeah, I did three ten. It was. It worked out to be sort of a, a bit of a cluster because my mm. hook grip was acting up on today. I didn't really set it properly. All sort of. Do you habits. always pull hook grip? Yeah, the last couple of years I've been hook. I don't think I've ever competed without hook. Mm. You know, even in, when I pulled sumo, um, I always hooked. Yeah. I, I have a vivid memory of you pulling sumo in your friend's shed. In your friend's garage, like I have a very vivid memory. I think you did like a test day or something like that. Yeah. I have a very vivid memory of watching that video. Like I don't know why that stood out to me. I think it was because like, why is this big fucker pulling sumo? Like, I, I also would have been one of those people. Sumo's cheating, but now I don't feel that way anymore. Um, let me ask you, how do you find hook grip for like all the volume work with deadlifts? I don't really use it for volume work. Yeah, um, I've hooked a set of four for two ninety. Um, Damn. And that, that worked well, but that was in the winter as well. So yeah, yeah. sometimes it, it can act up in the summer when it's a bit slippery and whatever else um, your grip can go. Mm. But um, yeah, I tend to just keep it for the top sets yeah. or if I'm doing singles and then have like a back down, say triple after, mm. I do it for the single and the triple. But I try to limit it because your thumbs do take a beating. Yeah. I, I used to always hook like all my sets and my thumbs were absolutely destroyed. Like my whole thumbnail was just completely black. Um, and all in here was just ripping off every yeah, time. So, that, man. not for me. Yeah, it's good for you. Yeah, especially on those uh, those rogue power bars. They're, There's something different about them, isn't there? Yeah, they're like, quite early. <laughs> yeah, like I was having this conversation the other day. Somebody was in deadlift. It was Beck Phillips was actually over. He's lifting with us at Western Euros, and he was deadlifting in abs with me. Um, we went in on a Monday just with the way his flights worked out, and it was just the two of us. And he set up to do his deadlifts on a rogue bar, and I was like, "Man, use an elite bar, man." <laughs> and he's like, "It's all the same." I'm like, no, it's not. And he fucking paid the price because the rogue bite's different. But uh, let me ask then, it was in that period of time you were coaching with Odyssey, you were, we had just come into COVID. Was it around this time you discovered then you were celiac? Yes, towards the end of the, the pandemic. So the pandemic would have been, what, early 2020 yeah. into late 2021 almost. Yeah, can't believe you're forgetting. Like, this is a huge part of history. Of yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a big part of my life, you know. It was a big turning point for me as well. And um, so I had been quite fatigued, um, I think, in the 2021. And I'd been eating. At the time, I remember my breakfast used to be, like, I go through phases with food where you just, eat the same fucking thing pretty yeah. much you now you, you do that if you're eating you know high calorie foods you can't be switching around everything every day because yeah. your your budget and shopping list will be all over the place but i used to have a big massive bowl of porridge mm -hmm. with like you know peanut butter honey uh, like whatever berries blueberries um and then i'd have a big a fry so yeah. i'd have like four slices of toast Class. um you know baked beans you know eggs rashes um and all of that you know full of gluten you know mm -hmm. this wasn't all gluten-free stuff and then I'd just be bloated walking around the house then for about an hour or two. And then I'd go train. And then, you know, I was, I was just like gasping for air after, you know, a warm up set of squats things like 120, 170 for say one or two reps. I'd be really, really out of breath. I was like, what's going on here? And then my work capacity sort of dropped. And then I realized, all right, something might be going on weird here. And this was at the time I started following Ben Crockwell. Yeah. And he was always going on about getting your bloods done, yeah. making sure your, you know, bloods are at a healthy level. So I was like, right, maybe this is something I need to do. And because I was always sort of health focused, I wanted to stay on top of things, make sure it was healthy. And I got my blood done and I found out that I was heavily anemic. You know, my red blood cell count was, you know, on the floor. Right, okay. <laughs> and so was my iron levels as a result. Um, and I thought it was from, because I used to donate a lot of blood. Mm -hmm. So I donated like three times in that year. Um, because I have O negative, so it's a universal donor, so anyone can can use my blood. And they're always texting me like, "We crit stocks are critically low, come donate." So I was like, "Okay." Um, so I thought it was that. So I started taking iron tablets, and I stopped donating blood for about six months. Mm -hmm. Went back, got my blood done again. My red blood cell count had come back up, but my iron was still very, very low. So I was like, "What the fuck's going on here?" And then my sister told me. So she, her daughter, my niece, is also celiac, mm -hmm. and they they found out when she was very young. She was only one years old, and she wasn't responding very well to gluten at all. And she was always crying, very pale in the face, like sort of sickly looking and rejecting food, vomiting. Um, and then 
she said to me, anemia is a red flag for celiac disease. Mm -hmm. So I was like, right, okay, better get tested for this now. So I went and got my blood done again. And uh, they they test for an enzyme called anti-transglutaminase, anti-TTG. Mm -hmm. And that was, you know, through the roof. Um, right. And that raised the alarm then, okay, I'm celiac. So went and got um, a scope down into my stomach. And the doctors put it down. I didn't get uh, the anesthesia. My parents were like, you don't need the anesthesia for it. It's fine. It's fine. Should have got the anesthesia. Oh, man. It was the most humbling experience of my life. I was curled up in a ball on my side, gagging with like tears coming down my face as they were probing me. Um, but as soon as they got the tube down into my stomach, the doctor was like, yeah, you're definitely celiac. All, literally all the, you know, the little villi, yeah. like structures in your small intestine, the little hair structures, they absorb nutrients, completely just flattened in my stomach. So right. just wasn't able to absorb, you know, much food at all. And hence why I wasn't uh, absorbing iron and was mm. anemic. So yeah, since then I was... So that that's an... Obviously there's a few questions there, right? But the big one is, once you found out and you had those couple of weeks and months then of naturally like course correcting the diet, when did you start to feel the difference? I would say, you know, nearly sort of straight away, sort of just to do with the whole bloating side mm. of things and digestion. You know, my my stomach wasn't out touching the table. And it, it, to be honest, it actually made a lot of sense because when I was growing up in school, I used to always just be, you know, farting nonstop in class. <laughs> That's what I was known as in school. I was like the guy that, you know, stinks out the class. Yeah, yeah. And uh, whenever I was out drinking with my mates, pints yeah. of Guinness or whatever, my stomach yeah. used to always just be bloated out touching the table and very uncomfortable um, and letting rip all the time. So... Um, but yeah, sorry, where was I there? I lost my... Sh what, like, when was it? Was there like a oh, yeah. day you woke up, you're like, God damn, I feel amazing. Yeah, no, it, it gradually got better over time. It wasn't, there wasn't one day where I just sort of woke up, but over time I did notice my, my energy levels were a lot better. I was a lot yeah. more motivated to get out, go for walks, and um, I could feel that as well. I wasn't gasping for air in my training. My mm. work capacity increased. I'd say it did take a good few months because, you know, takes time. healing, healing your goal after, you know, something like that would take a long, long time. And then... Like, obviously, that it was a bit of a saga to get to the answer, but, like, was there a certain amount of relief when you found out that, oh, this is what it is? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it was actually, like, a lot of people, they would have been sort of imagine like, oh, what am I going to do now? But for me, it was like, this is a good thing. Yeah. You know, I, I saw the, the positives to it. You know, it's going to make my training skyrocket, which is one thing, <laughs> which will help me build muscle and get stronger and improve at powerlifting, and which yeah. it did. You know, those three years after, I went from being, you know, 98 kilos to now like 113, 114 kilos and you know, stronger than ever. So Yeah. And, and I think that's kind of like that sort of thing. Firstly, it's perspective, but I think that's what really separates like people with a truly like competitive mindset is like you were inevitably going to be faced with an obstacle. For you, it was this celiac diagnosis. But like rather than being like, fuck, I can't have points of Guinness anymore. It's like, class i have an answer now it's something i can navigate around and get even better later on oh my lifts are going to go great now because i'm not going to be fucking bloated and fucking farting and sweating when i'm doing a warm-up that's a i think that's a good mindset to have and definitely something i think more athletes need to adopt is this uh, you've probably seen it yourself i think one of the cool things apparently to get more popular is more people get into it but you see these people have these emotional highs and lows and a training session doesn't go great whereas like you were fucking like probably suffering for a long time without realizing it. And then you got like an answer, which is essentially a diagnosis of, you know, your shit at digesting gluten. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, which some people might read into as a bad thing, but you obviously found the, the benefit out of it. I, in that though, like with that, like obviously it's a fantastic thing to discover. You can navigate it now and you've obviously been popping off since. Is there anything that you like are like, fuck man, I, I miss brown bread? Or is there something like that that like stands out that you're like, ah, fuck. Yeah, man, like, I'd say points of Guinness. Points of Guinness. It's definitely one because, yeah, I'd say there's, there's definitely a niche in the market for, uh, you know, a good gluten-free stout. Like, yeah. There is one, you know, there's there's actually two pubs in Ireland that have gluten-free stout. Uh, it's called Stag Stout. And is it any good? Yeah, it's lovely, man. Like, yeah, I, I, I put a few of my mates onto it as well and they said, oh, it's fucking lovely. Yeah. So and there's two places in, sorry, not in Ireland, in Dublin that yeah. have it. So, and they're in town. So one in Stony Keep Bay. that in mind if you're gluten, gluten intolerant or yeah. celiac. Yeah, the cobblestone is, that's the name of the spot. But yeah, Guinness definitely one and just, you know, not having to, you know, look up menus when yeah. I'm going out eating uh, to make sure they have good gluten-free options is definitely one as well. It can be a bit of a nuisance when mm. you're eating out and just drinking alcohol probably in general, which isn't a bad thing for powerlifting. But when I am out drinking, I am limited to sort of cider, yeah. gluten-free stuff and spirits, mm. you know, so. Did, have you had any like accidental gluten ingesting since? 
Yes. What happened? I, I had uh, there was one like bad episode. I'm sure. I'm sure I have you know had you know little small traces of it every now and then, which I've been fine because I went 24 years without ever noticing. Yeah. So, um, but. Yeah, well, I was in Austria in Vienna, um, start of this year around February, mm-hmm. and we they have a gluten free McDonald's over there, and they have all the options on the menu. They have those um, the things you order off the big screens. Yeah, yeah. So I went up and it was like GF available or whatever. So I clicked in. I was like happy days. Clicked into the G- one that said GF, order two, like Big Mac burgers or whatever. Didn't realize you actually had to select you know a gluten free bun. Right. Then scoffed the two burgers. Obviously. Went home, went to sleep about three hours later, about three in the morning, woke up, just a really, really bad uh, sensation of heartburn. Yeah. Um, just real discomfort in my stomach. It was like a stabbing sensation almost as if something was trying to, you know, break its way out my stomach. Like just went aliens. To the, literally like an alien, yeah. Mm. And I, I went to the bathroom, just spewed my ring up. That was right. about it. Oh, for, shit, right. Yeah. Have you found that like because you haven't been eating it, you're even more intolerant to it? Like your body doesn't tolerate it at all? Like, Yeah, I'd say definitely I would be a lot more sensitive to yeah. it now. Um, especially now that my my gut's actually a bit more healed, so mm. um, yeah, definitely would be a bit more sensitive. So I try to avoid it as best I can if there's any cross contamination, especially for celiac disease, rather than just gluten intolerance. Yeah, you need to be that bit more uh, diligent with your mm. gluten free diet. Yeah, and I suppose then like the the thing to kind of highlight here is that like, and it's one of like I've had Ben Crockwell on here before a couple of times. I had Mark on just before he's working. With, I know you're working with Ben a bit now as well. Uh, I'd always tried, like, I think I've actually texted you about it before with the blood work stuff. Like, like what's, like, where does the validity lie? Do, from your experience now working with people for nutrition and from your own experience, is blood work something you would typically recommend? Oh, absolutely. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Especially if you're, you know, trying to improve your performance, your overall health and lifestyle as well. Mm. And just having a basis or an idea of where your bloods are currently at, what you may need to do. See, recently enough, you know, after, you know, bulking up for 120, I think it was last year. Yeah. Um, my cholesterol got quite high as well. So that was only from me staying on top of my buds that I realized that, so that I needed to cut down a bit of weight. So I did that and um, got my LDL back down Mm -hmm. to the healthy levels and happy out. But no, definitely if you're someone who's, you know, always tired or has some form of symptoms like bloating or, you know, constant diarrhea or after certain foods, which definitely isn't normal. You know, I'm saying a lot of people do, they wake up in the morning and have a bit of a runny stool. That isn't normal. You know, you need to, Keep on top of your blood, especially as you get older, you know, if you're you know, in your mid-twenties, at least yeah. you know, stay on top of that, you know, twice a year. I suppose then for the cost of what it is, even being told, yeah, all is good, it's probably worth the peace of mind. Uh, it's definitely something I know even for myself. That's something I've I, I asked you about. I've asked Ben about it. Uh, I got some blood work done late last year and everything was okay. It was one or two, like, like I'd say amber flags, but nothing crazy. Um, but even that, like, I'm definitely more conscious of, like, I'm, I became a dad recently, like, so I'm like, I definitely kind of want to keep an eye on those sorts of things. I think, like, post-Westerns, that'll be the next thing to do. Uh, so w- what's your recommendation if you're working with people once a year, twice a year? What do you think? Yeah, I'd say twice a year, yeah. especially if you go through long periods of prepping where you'd be gaining a lot of weight or losing a lot of weight. Yeah. Um, just even in general, mm. twice a year is a good rule of thumb just to make sure that everything is you know, in the right place and yeah. there isn't anything underlying going on. You know? I think it's probably worth noting as well. Like, I mean, I I don't know if it's just exclusively a thing with lads because they said you were dealing with celiac disease for 24 years and just kind of got on with it. I think like it's a case of like, I don't know about you, but whenever I talk to lads, the lads will just like suffer for a very long time because it's <laughs> the norm. Like Vinny for fucking ages has had like a really bad cough since he had COVID back in like 2021. I'm like, man, go to the fucking doctor. <laughs> like, that it's probably something that's quite easily solvable. You know what I mean? Uh, but I think we just like, ah, it's fine. You know what I mean? And then, you know, 30 years later, we're dead. You know what I'm saying? And it was that thing that was wrong with them in 2021. But uh, now that is, I do, I think that's a really good message with these things. And I think it's like that if you are health focused, and I'd imagine to a degree, everyone, when they walked into the gym, it was, yeah, we want to get fucking yoked. But it's also to not be like in a mobile 40 year old that can't pick up a pencil off the floor if they drop it. Um, so maybe staying on top of the blood work is a good one. And that ties in quite well with then like the nutrition, as you said, like the massive facet of it. And that's something I want to ask you about then as a nutrition coach and working directly with powerlifters. I know not just powerlifters. As I mentioned, you are working with Ben in the Better Man Project. Am I right in saying that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So you're obviously not just helping guys get bigger and stronger. You're also helping people get absolutely fucking yoked and shredded. Them boys, all the lads he advertised, man. What the fuck? Yeah, you know, the goal for them is simply just get as lean as they can. You they know? look great, though. 
No, they they look great and yeah. they feel great as a result. And um, you know, it's it's sort of two sides of the same coin. You know, getting yeah. big and strong, getting lean and jacked. Mm. You know, they can be a bit paradoxical at times, and I feel that way. You know, sometimes I might feel like a bit of a fraud or whatever trying to coach these guys to get leaner. But um, you know, I've done it before myself. Yeah, one hundred percent. You know, I know that I can do it as well. It's just you know. They say walk in the walk, I suppose. Um, Man, no one is going to look at you and go, that guy doesn't know how to get me shredded. You know what I mean? Like you've lit- <laughs> The evidence is on Instagram. You know what I mean? You're just existing in a realm where being bigger and stronger makes more sense. You know what I mean? I'm sure yeah. if you like stopped powerlifting tomorrow and you know, you were like, you know what, fuck it, I'm going to become an, a Gymshark influencer. I'm sure you'd be <laughs> with a size 28 waist and a fucking eight pack and all that. Like, you can do the work if you have to do it, if you want to switch gears. Like, No, absolutely. Yeah. It's, and as we discussed earlier, you know, it's important just to keep the, the head screwed on and mm. have your focus on the goal you have at hand. For me, it's competing for Ireland at Westerns. Mm. For the guys, you know, the entrepreneurs, I'm sure you're aware that yep. sort, that sort of Ben's niche is, yep. is men in their 30s, entrepreneurs. Mm. Um, it's just, you know, building that sort of mental focus. And by being on top of your nutrition and training and, el- and everything else, you have that better focus yep. um, for your day-to-day life as well. I think is it's I I want to touch off something with powerlifting, but just on that with the because they are they're all like a lot of the guys he works with are lads that are like you know they're working sixty eight hour weeks. A lot of them run their own businesses. They're uh, you know managing a lot like they're very very high stress jobs. They're making a lot of money, but like that that comes at new levels, new devils. So the nutrition and training has to be something that's done in such a way that like fits with what they're trying to do. And I always think that's it's something that stood out to me before. It was. Uh, particularly when you're in business and you're at that level, most of these people are going to be the case of if you walk into a bit like a meeting, it doesn't matter how nice your clothes are. If you could, if you're not somebody that can show up in good Nick knows how to take care of themselves, their, not just your hygiene, but also your, like, your physique. If you're coming in, you're like, you know, you're the only fat guy in the room. And that's pr- the, probably not the most sensitive way to put it, but that's the way it fucking is. You know what I mean? If you walk in and everyone else there is a jacked motherfucker and you're a, like a tubal lard, I think it it's instills in, a tiny sense of distrust because you're disorganized in one facet of your life. Whereas you've got these guys who are like as busy as they are, they're locked in on everything. Like they're, they're taking every box. So if you can do it at the highest level, surely you can do it almost every step of the way down. I know that's not really like a, a nuance to take, but I know I've heard like, uh, I don't know if you know, Patrick Beth Be- Be- David is, he runs something called Valuetainment on YouTube. He talks a lot about that, uh, about like, you know, being in shape is also another facet of being a successful businessman because it instills trust. Oh, this guy's got his shit together. You know what I mean? Yeah, it instills that discipline mentality yeah. as well, you know, and a lot of these guys, they just, they don't have time for all this sort of sort of little nuances as well. Yeah. You sort of give them just the, you know, set targets each week, you know, mm. track your steps, stay on top of your, your calories and your macros. Yep. You know, dial in your sleep. Um, How do they do with that one? No, they, they, a lot of them would be pretty good with their sleep. You know, yeah. they understand that sleep is going to affect their mental focus for work if and their stress levels as well. You know, there yeah. is a correlation there between sleep and your stress. Um, if one suffers, so does the other. And yeah. it's a vicious cycle like that, you know. Um, so they stay on top of these things. They like to stay on top of these things and improve them. Gamify um, it. Like it's 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 a stat to fill, you know. It's, it's, a, it's a target to hit. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, they don't they don't really care too much about the subtle little nuances with things. Yeah, they just give them those sort of targets to work on each week. They hit them and they get the results as a result, you know. It's quite, it's quite simple like that, you know. Do you uh, find they're a very particular type of person? Like, you know, like you can give them very clear, concise instructions. Like, is it, do you feel like the communication's different dealing with those types of people versus dealing with like a powerlifter about their nutrition? Yeah, a little bit, you know. Yeah. Um, sometimes they can be a bit harder to reach out to, you know, because... Yeah. They're so busy. Um, Mm. So you might have, you know, very short words. And we do also have what's called uh, game plan calls, you know, every month. Um, So some of them would hop on them. Um, But no, they're very regimented with their schedule. So you're trying to find time that works for them. It can be a bit difficult, but, Mm -hmm. um, you know, definitely make it work as well. And then, you know, powerlifting, it's sort of more just, you know, making sure that you're adequately fueled Mm -hmm. and make sure that you're performing well. Whereas these guys, it's just, you know, Tick those boxes with your steps, sleep, calories in, calories out, Mm. um, weighing yourself each morning as well. Same with, it is, there are a lot of similarities between the two, but it is a bit easier, I'd say, to navigate powerlifting nutrition because you don't need to worry too much about timing of your nutrition, I'd say, Mm -hmm. with regards to powerlifting because you're only training sort of four times a week. And once you're meeting your sort of calorie macro requirements, you're going to be well fueled up for your next training session, you know, whereas these guys would need to be, you know, know when to eat their 
their lunch or their pre-workout meal if they're training first thing in the morning making sure that they're you know hydrating well yeah you know getting a, a light carb snack in caffeinating as well so mm. some subtle differences but generally the most of the basics are the same yeah i think that's it with like almost all nutrition outside of very specific outside of very specific needs like obviously if somebody's cutting like a dramatic weight cut in a very short period of time it's going to be a whole different set of advice for somebody who's just like trying to maintain a good physique year round um, but i'm always so interested in that because i think this is something i've found right when people get into powerlifting the first thing they fixate on is the weight on the bar right obviously because the outcome is the biggest weight wins more often than not but I've definitely found the longer I'm in it, not just for myself as an athlete, but also with working with people, the ones that can dial in on all the externals will typically have a much greater margin for error in training. Whereas if you're only tracking training performance, the margin for errors are much smaller and it can be, so like, for example, like if we look at sleep, macros, calories, nutritional quality, and even stress management, step count, all these very minor things that we can manage. The more people tick those boxes, the more training becomes a better measure of where we can go. Like I found with, um, I'm sure you've met, you know, James, James McLaughlin, Jimmy. Yeah, yeah. Like in the time, I've been working with him since last June and he's put basically 100 kilos on his total. Uh, he's, it's particularly in the last couple of weeks, the last couple of months, I should say, since his last meet, he's really dialed in his execution, his technique has gotten way better. And I'm very, ambi I've very big ambitious goals for him now coming into November. He's lifting at the Ab Series 19 in November. But I think that was what it was is, is that he really doubled down on externals. And he, another thing he did is he committed to being heavier. Because for a long time, it was very much, you know, the want to be lean, you know? And he was like sitting like sub 90 kilos, like 85 kilos, I think when we started, I think like now he's like 96. And it's reflected in how easily he's moving what would have been previous one at maxes, but also how easily he's moving them. And you can see uh, even he doesn't flag during sessions as much because he's he's more adequately fueled going in. And I think it's that thing with powerlifters and all athletes. I think if you're not really, if you're kind of flim flamming your nutrition and kind of like half assing it, you're leaving so much on the table. Um, and given like the number of lifters you work with, would you say that that is a common trend? The ones that like maybe if they are hitting a stumbling block, one of the first places you could look is your nutritional quality or even just tracking and things like that. Absolutely. This applies to powerlifters and to the general population as well. You know, you'd see a lot of guys going into the gym from training in Westside and Barbell yeah. all those years. Uh, you'd see guys coming in, they look generally the same year in year out and these mm. are people who don't wouldn't have a focus on their nutrition and um, same with powerlifters they've hit a you know a blockade with their total they can't get through it and then they start to work with me then and they're like oh my god i'm I'm repping my you know old one max for for three yeah and it's like unlocking a whole new element of newbie gains again you know mm. by just focusing in that bit more and being adequately fueled and your your sleep and stress and everything else and um, i try not to major too much on the minor things you know but just you know those little sort of checklist of things is generally what's going to give you yeah. probably 99% of your results. But also you mentioned about um, making sure that performance is coming up as you're gaining weight, which I think is a big thing too. You know, people try to bulk up without really ever lifting more weight. Mm. You know, that, that's another recipe for disaster there as well. So mm. you want to make sure that you're adequately fueled up for those performance improvements and driving that performance up over time. That's what's going to lead to, to you getting bigger and stronger. Do you know actually an observation is, and I, I find this a lot when people decide they're going to bulk, right? So if we take the average person that's just at maintenance, right? When they cut, right? What people are always doing is, how can I still keep as much food in, but still lose weight, right? So they're, and they're usually quite jilted. They'll track every calorie to do all the steps. They'll make sure they prioritize sleep when they're cutting. Because obviously that's the result. You're trying to get leaner or trying to lose weight. People will be really dialed in there. But it's almost like I've, I've seen this so often where people are like, right, it's bulking time. I'm going to eat like an unsupervised child in a sweet shop. That means I'm going out every Friday and Saturday. I'm fucking ordering Domino's every Tuesday and Thursday. You know, I don't think they get it. You know what I mean? You still do all the same things. You know, you're still going to get your activity outside the gym. You're still going to prioritize good quality sleep. You're still going to get your water in. You're still going to manage your stress. You're just going to start bringing your calories up. You're still going to track. All the same things are still going to happen. But you, you're going in with this plan to like gradually gain weight over time. You're not just going to go in and eat the first fucking thing you see and not worry about your calories. Have you ever encountered that with people where they're like, oh, it's bulking season, it's time to just fucking eat everything? Yeah, I've encountered it with, you know, clients before, I've encountered it with myself as well. And, and especially after just being in like a phase of, you mm. know, losing body fat and cutting, um, 
you know, you let the hair down, you yeah. let all hell break loose, but ultimately you just get back to where you were before yeah. sooner than you'd like. Um, so just trying to keep things steady. Yeah. You know, you don't actually need, especially if you've got years of experience in training, you don't need a massive, massive surplus. Yeah. You know, you just need a slight surplus to, you know, keep ticking over, keep the weight, rate of gain gradual, because you can only build so much muscle and that gets smaller and smaller as you get more experienced. Mm-hmm. Um, so w- what your, your, what's the word term I'm looking for? Your level of return reduces. Yeah. So yeah, the, the deficit ultimately gets smaller. And yeah. um, that's what me and Connor have been doing. Connor Kiernan does my nutrition. Yeah. Uh, shout out Abs Nutrition. And um, he, you know, took it real slow with me the last two preps we've done. And that, that's been majorly successful, especially after cutting down the weight, getting a bit leaner, mm-hmm. um, just slowly edging up the body weight over time. You know, even for me, I think it's been, you know, half a kilo in a month. Yeah. Which for a lot of people would be quite slow. Yeah. Um, but no, when you look at it over a four or six month period, that's, you know, two, three kilos to an already quite experienced lifter as well so yeah you also probably don't want your leverages to change rapidly over the course of like eight weeks you know what i mean i think that's another thing people forget like as you're gaining weight particularly if it, you're someone has a predisposition to put it on your waist your belt's going to feel completely different like i noticed when i cut down for me it's one of the first places that feels different is my torso i feel like the, my brace goes to shit as soon as i hit anything below 95 kilos um you have to i have to work twice as hard to get tight under the squat Usually deadlifts are fine, but still, that's a very noticeable thing. When I was trying to be heavier, squats feel fucking fantastic. You know what I mean? Have that nice little bit of chubbiness, you know, <laughs> fill out the belt a bit more. Um, but you mentioned that, you know, working with Connor. And Connor, I think, has put together a really good track record of success with all the athletes he's prepped uh, nutrition wise. And obviously, he's popping off himself at the moment. Was that a game changer for you with working with Connor exclusively for nutrition? Is that what was like a, a turning point for you as a lifter? Do you think, ah, now this is like another level up? You mentioned, you know, I didn't actually ask about going from Odyssey to Abs. I will in a moment but you know you you went from doing a bit of your own training doing a little bit of powerlifting training uh, working with odyssey strength for a while then you obviously transition to abs and now you're obviously working with connor quite closely for nutrition has that felt like each one is like an incremental learn making the best version of ryan mccann we've seen so far yeah definitely uh i think my whole time as since i've moved up to the under 120 class i've been working with connor mm. Um, and it's definitely just sort of removed a lot of guesswork for me, which, you know, a lot of people can find very stressful when they're trying to um, lose body fat or gain muscle is, you know, where do I go? Mm-hmm. What do I need to do? And just having him there to give me, you know, set targets, keep me accountable, tell me where I'm, you know, being shit as yeah. well. Um, Probably helps out your mates. Like. Yeah, because even though like I, I am a coach and you are yourself, mm-hmm. you know, we're still human and yep. we, we still do fall down and have areas that we do need to improve. Um, for me, a lot of the time, especially in the last year, it was my daily step counts was yeah. a big thing. Um, and working two jobs, you know, full time in pharmaceuticals and with, uh, you know, the coaching thing, my step count would take a hit because I was, you know, desk based for a lot of, mm-hmm. a lot of the time. So um, he was always, you know, trying to whip me into shape, gave me a few good ideas of just moving about more during the day after each meal. Mm-hmm. Um, just simple things like that can go a long way have you feeling that bit better a bit sharper for training a bit you know better recovered too mm. I think this, the step counts one I completely agree with man like uh, I notice it myself like I'll always feel and the thing is I think it's shit when you like that like I have I do like all my check-ins on a Monday it's a big day yeah. and if it gets to like 6 o'clock in the morning on like 3,000 steps I'm like fuck's sake but then <laughs> even, man to be honest sticking on the headphones I usually listen to like audiobooks or podcasts I fucking feel great when I come home then and I'm done. Like I hit the target, I feel really good. I have something small to eat and I'm straight back into the work. It feels way better than had I just worked through that hour and been like, fuck the steps, I'll get more work done. It's you almost become more sluggish. I know Ben talks about it as well, like each meal, 10 minute walk. Man, that stuff works. It's just stacking small wins throughout the day. But uh, you mentioned as well, like being a coach and then working with a coach as well. And I think this is something that sometimes people miss is that for us, like, think about it. You're If you're coaching, you know, 10, 20, 30 people already, the last thing you want to be doing is looking at what you've to do. So just even from freeing up the mental bandwidth of where to go next, what the next six weeks is going to look like, where the game plan goes, what should I, like, I know for a big one for me, is like, I don't want to think about, like, what I have to do when I go to the gym. I just want a range to work in. You know what I mean? Same with, like, with calories and macros and steps. I don't want to think about that shit. Just give me a rough guide to work through and I can figure some stuff out for myself. But just having somebody take that mental load off, you go in and do the work, you tick the box, things will keep moving in that direction. You don't have to second guess it. Um, have you ever tried self-coaching? Yeah, I did for a bit. Um, box, my it? own nutrition, yeah. You, you can make box. very some emotional decisions, yeah. you know, be it, you know, just not 
wanting to gain weight anymore mm. than cutting or just the opposite you know yep. if you want to fucking start bulking again after you know shedding a few kilos your lifts may have suffered for a day yep. even though it might have just been training fatigue rather than as opposed to you know the calorie deficit so yep. it removes that sort of emotional um yeah, decision making, I suppose. Yeah. I've been I've been there, especially with the bulking one. You have a bad day, you look in the mirror, you try on clothes, like I look like a fat piece of shit in these now. It's like, man, you can just get a new pair of jeans, you know what I mean? Like that that fit you when you're a bit chubbier. But like, you're know, like, fuck it, it's time to cut again. And it, it's true. Like, whereas if you have somebody who can rationalize stay in the course for a bit longer, you will get the return. But I always try to look at it. It's a conversation I've started having with a lot of my own lifters. It's like if we have like a scale of one to ten. And you say you want to lift at nationals, you want to lift at Western Euros or junior, junior Euros or Worlds or whatever it might be, right? You have a big goal, right? Something outside the realm of just competing at a local meet. If there's a scale of one to 10 of how much you're physically doing to get there, if it's anything less than a seven, you're not doing enough in my opinion. Yeah. So like, yeah, sure. You can fuck up sleep the odd time. Like you mentioned, you know, you're going to have a weekend where you go out, somebody's fucking birthday, you're going to have some drink, your training's going to suffer a teeny little bit. That's okay. Yeah. Right. But I think if you're somebody who like never really tracks, you're not weighing yourself ever. You're not really knowing what you don't like, hey, man, Jesus Christ. Like, like I've, I've a, as I mentioned, I have a baby now, man, the amount of people that are like, people like say like how babies cry a lot. It's like, yeah, of course they're babies. They're emotionally dysregulated. The amount of adults that are emotionally dysregulated because they like, <laughs> Like, yeah, I'm, in, I'm like 38 years old and I'm going to bed at two o'clock and I have to be up at seven. It's like, man, go to fucking bed, man. What are you doing? You're an adult. Get off fucking Netflix. Get off your PlayStation and get off your phone. What are you doing? Like, and I think that's so, it's one of those things that I get it with people where they're like, look, I have such a hard time breaking this habit. It's like, this is why you hire someone. They go, yeah. get off the phone. This is your goal for this week. Uh, like, I've, I'm sure you've probably, have you actually had a lifter that you've seen, like, you've, you know that they start working with you and you've seen that linear progress? Like say somebody in abs, like if you've seen like they were they were working away doing their own thing, and then when they did start working with Ryan McCann or even Connor Kane or any other crew at Abs Nutrition, you've actually probably you've seen them go ah, it's like a light switch moment. You see them make progress. Like I've seen it with uh, Connor does nutrition for Zeta, Zeta McCabe, yeah, and I can see it in her. Like she's gotten way way better since she like that's a metric you start tracking now. Have you had that with anyone that you've tangibly seen? Yeah, so recently enough, um, it's just. Kyle Capetlin. Yeah, I don't know Kyle. How, yeah, yeah, he, yeah, he joined me for nutrition recently yeah. enough. And, he's a great kid, man. And, you know, it's it's unlocked a whole lot of gains for him now yeah. as well. He's repping his old maxes. Yeah. Um. So he he's a more recent one. But you also mentioned there about, you know, just your having your sort of habits and what you're doing. If it's below a seven, um, you're not doing enough. Mm. And I've seen people who have been, you know, perfect with everything. um, And then one little, you know, minor slip up and it completely derails whole months of progress and, you know, they feel guilty about it. And this is where the whole perfectionism thing comes in. Mm -hmm. I think if people are perfectionists, they can uh, focus too much on these minor things, which can be bad about tracking all your little variables as well. Mm -hmm. You know, that can be a drawback. And, you know, there's there's the whole, um, you know, eating disorder debate as well, where, you know, tracking your food may not be the best thing for you. But, um, you know, it's important just to you know keep the head screwed on. If, if something's not going perfect, then, mm-hmm. you know, at least the other things are, you know, it's being consistent and seeking that over perfection over the long course. Mm-hmm. And that's ultimately where you're going to, you know, progress over the long term and, and change into the, the person and the, the lifter you want to be. Mm. So do you think tracking leads to eating disorders? No, it doesn't lead to eating disorders. Essentially. I think, you know, we, we, there's some cohorts of the population who tracking may not be the best thing for. And I certainly think people with, you know, previous bad relationships with food or eating disorders, mm. you know, it may not be the best course of action for them. It may, it may also be a really good thing. And you know, it might teach them a bit more about, you know, food being fuel and that, you know, certain foods aren't actually bad for you and you shouldn't feel guilty about eating certain things. But, you know, f- for the most part, it may not suit, you know, certain people. Mm-hmm. I've, I'm always interested about this topic of conversation right because i've heard it before actually there was news for a while i'm not going to like name names because it was a there was a gym involved but uh essentially somebody did like a photo shoot prep with a gym and then tried to take the gym owner to court because they were saying because of you now i have an eating disorder because you put me on calories and macros and i didn't really know what i was getting into i am of the opinion that if you're a consenting adult with a smartphone and you've google you can figure a lot of things out. You know what I mean? You can know if this is going to be the right fit for you. Like that trainer didn't self-select you to be someone to say you want to be leaner. You did that. You decided this was a priority for you. And then it's this person's job to 
get you the results you're paying them for. You know what I mean? I'm kind of in that boat. Now, I do think there's probably an element of maybe too many people get involved in these things are like, you know, I need to go through an eight week transformation or, you know, I want six pack abs that maybe actually don't, maybe they're not emotionally in the correct place mm. to do that right now. Maybe they would be better off like going gym for a while and maybe just being more focused on nutritional quality as opposed to any specific numbers. I know one recommendation I'd seen from someone before a doctor uh, from Barbell Medicine. Do you follow Barbell Medicine? Yeah. Austin Baraki was talking about it before whenever he's not tracking, he just weighs himself in the morning and in the evening. And he just does that whenever he's not tracking. And if he notices his weight's going up, he eats a little less. And if he notices his weight's going down, he eats a little more. And that's how he just averages off. Yeah, I mean, like, you can do that. That's definitely a method that works, you know. You can make a lot of progress by not tracking your intake. But yeah. it's definitely that bit more accurate, I would say, as well. Just having a basis of where your calories and macros need to be. Plus the whole weight equation to so many things yeah. that can influence your body weight. You know, if you eat saltier foods or more heavily yeah. processed foods, you know, you, can, you may wake up heavier. Mm -hmm. Um, and that could be a once-off thing. And mm -hmm. then you could start eating less as a result, which could lead you to, you know, underfueling then. So I think it's good to have a, a base sort of calorie yeah. um, and, approach. And I think with that, with that, like when we talk about tracking, we're obviously, I know for me anyway, with the majority of people that are listening to this, you're talking about powerlifters primarily, yeah. or at least people that are, they have, again, self-selected to be involved in a sport that it's outside the realm of just looking a certain way or feeling a certain way. You're, you're trying to perform, right? So... I, I was I was talking to another coach this week about it actually might have been Marquez when he was here last <laughs> time. Um, I don't know anyone that lifts on a national level or international level for Ireland that doesn't do something with their nutrition or that doesn't have a coach. I don't know anyone. You know what I mean? Like, do, can you name anyone that you can think of off the top of your head that isn't like eating to fuel big performance, potentially with the aid of a nutrition coach or tracking, or isn't working directly with a coach? Because I personally can't. Um, I'd say super heavyweight lifters would probably be more of that. Sorry they can get away with they, more. They can get away with just eating. You yeah, know? Yeah. Um, yeah, but, but I, no, I, that's I, a good point. That you know you what I mean? Like I think of it, because I'm obviously thinking about my, my weight class and every single person I can see. So even coming into, like we I look at the under 93s for Open Nationals this year. Uh, Damien Nam works with City Gym. He is going up the weight class because he usually competes 83 because he has a small baby at home. It's easier to not cut weight when you have a small baby because babies don't sleep the way we need to sleep. Definitely something I'm feeling at the moment. Um, then you've Kean Madden, who has been so locked in for years, no matter who's been, I know he's coached by the strength guys right now, but he's always been really dialed in with his nutrition. Uh, Matthew Henry, same thing. He, uh, I was talking to Jordan Bright, his girlfriend, and she was like, even when they go down to country, and like he was down for uh, a meet in the Marina Market for the RSPF. They were staying in Airbnb. He brought his scale so he could weigh all his food because <laughs> the guy is fucking dialed in. Uh, I don't know there's another guy Aaron Blackmore don't know him that well but uh, Beck Phillips same thing he works with Connor Kiernan Abs Nutrition um, Callum O'Matney works with Adam Phillips very close he has gone up a weight class again been diligent with the food me you know what I mean I'm in there <laughs> like this is like I've been a member of Abs since 2019 uh, I've worked with Shane Story for years for nutrition as well fucking another great guy on the nutrition front like I think you'll always see no matter who it is there's always that they're managing that extra variable yeah. and I think like I'm sure I'm sure you'll agree if you're a, a lifter you're at that regional level and you want to level up the next thing to look at if you're already working with a good powerlifting coach it's probably the nutrition yeah, absolutely. And you mentioned earlier on about um, guys over the long term mm. made progress. I'd say Aziz is one example. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's been working with me for quite a bit of time now. He's a real good example. He's been moving up through the weight class as well since moving up from 83. He's been steadily hitting PBs across the board. So mm. um, he's a good example of that. But no, I think it's monitoring those variables mm -hmm. and just doing them until you, they become second nature to you. Um, once you realize the benefit of those, you know, you don't want to go back to your old ways yeah. you realize that you know these have provided me with so much um, and just keep doing things until you can't imagine your life without them you know it's like going Man, to the honestly gym. I think that's the thing we're cursed now like I can't imagine a week where I'm not going to the gym at least yeah. four times a week like I'm like well fucking I have to lift bars for the rest of my life just to stay sane yeah absolutely or even like I can't remember the last time I've ever just like not thought about what I'm eating even though I'm not tracking like obviously po like say after we lift in Malta I'm staying there for another couple of days. I'm probably going to eat a lot of what I want, but yeah. I'm definitely going to be like 
right, well, I had a big breakfast. I'll probably go a little lighter at lunch to sit and like, you know, get a few more greens into me for some fiber so I can have something nice at dinner. Or if I do have a drink, I'll probably be like, yeah, I'm going to cap this at like two drinks for this meal. And then I'll see what the lads are doing after everyone's lifted. And maybe we'll all go. But I'll be always thinking ahead and trying to be conscious of that. And I think I'm like just cursed to do that now, you know? And I, But like in a way, I kind of like that because... I don't know about you, man, but this is something I definitely think about. I look, uh, there's actually, this is an old story. I don't know if I've told this on the podcast before. I used to work in FlyFit, right? Yeah. And a guy walked, so at the time I, I was 30 years old, 31, something like that. And a guy walked in and he's, he'd seen like he, I'd been squatting a bench and dead. And he goes, Ian, you won't be lifting all those heavyweights when you get up to my age, right? <laughs> and I was, I was like, yeah, yeah, whatever. And he was coming in, he had a bag with like bands and foam rollers and mini bands and balls and all this shit to roll on. And I was like, what? So we got into it. I was like, man, I said, like, fucking, like, what age are you? Turned out the guy was eight months younger than me. So I think there's this weird thing people have where they assume with age, your body just fucking falls apart. No. And like, man, like, I'm getting fucking, like, not old, but I'm older than a lot of you motherfuckers. And I feel pretty good. Like, my knees are a little sore at the moment. But I mean, that's a joke. Everyone's immediately goes, ah, that's age. It's like, it could be that I train at a fucking pretty high intensity all the time. You know what I mean? And maybe I need to fucking chill the fuck out, but I don't yeah. know how, you know? But this is what, so like, I'm I'm very happy to say, like, I've met other people that are younger than me that perform way worse than me and feel like shit. And I put a lot of that down to years and years of good, smart resistance training. And so I think a lot of it's your peer group um, and the people you surround yourself with. I'd imagine that's, a, we can talk a little bit about the, the swap over for you then, um, hear about from going from like, because Odyssey Strength are primarily online yeah. and you joined abs. I know for me, joining abs was like groundbreaking in terms of like how much more involved you can get with a community and being part of something bigger and having people that are like-minded to train alongside. Was that something you found when you joined? No, that was probably one of the main reasons why yeah. I joined. Um, now, I've seen, I've seen a quote today. Um, I can't remember what the exact words were, but it was like the journey for self-betterment becomes a quite a lonely place and this is the price you have to pay. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, it was just, I was training pretty much on my own like in fire in my mate's backyard and doing powerlifting for yeah. quite some time. And it was all online. Um, you know, it worked very well for me up to a point, but I, I thought I needed a change. And as you know, we mentioned, there was that golden era of abs. I call yeah. it golden era anyway. So yeah, it was yeah. like everyone was trained together. It was like you, Jake, Eamon, Ben, mm -hmm. even, you know, Barry Piggott would have been probably still around then. Just it, about. Like, very just barely because he had transitioned to jujitsu. I think he'd done his back in. But, you know, do you know Brick? Yeah, uh, Brick Fionn? as well. Yeah. Brick was there. Uh, Hinge Master. Did you ever meet Hinge Master Flex, AJ? Yes. Yeah. Like he was there. Uh, Jack Peters was another young guy that was there. He was really good. Uh, Ross and Jerk Stel. A, yeah. Yeah, man. Stel, Stel was there on Sunday, actually. Yeah, he was there. He's, he's good to see him back again, yeah. you know, and you had a lot of good junior lifters there at the time as well. So yeah. I was like, right, I need to get involved with, with this community because, you know, it seems like a great place to be. Everyone was seems to be thriving, you know. Mm. And um, yeah, that 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 was a big turning point for me, being able to get that feedback um, just from Jay in person, the coach in person, which, yeah. you know, it's, it can be quite underrated. You know, I, I actually never did, you know, on the floor PT and I just went straight to online. Yeah. Um, And then just the feedback from the other guys, the more, you know, senior guys who've got years of experience and the other, you know, even lifters who are younger than me, but are already representing Ireland. You know, I just wanted to be in that space and yeah, I haven't looked back since. Mm. Like I definitely, I would completely agree with all that. I actually think as well, like Jay is such an underrated coach. Yeah. Like I, th I think as he doesn't make like, he's not the most articulate person, right? <laughs> Let's be honest, right? <laughs> but like he came in the other day and we were talking about, I was squatting and he just gave me one small thing and he would just took him a minute to like describe it to me and then he showed me what he wanted me to do. And like I mentioned, I've been dealing with some knee pain now for nearly 12 months. I've been texting TJ, so hopefully we're going to sort that out soon. But uh, I squatted today then and nothing, no problems. I just did what he told me. I'm like, man, same with like, he gave me a correction for one of my lifters about bench press recently. And it's been like just a tiny little thing. And it took us a couple of weeks to kind of find a comfortable spot for it. But it's like, man, he just has such a good eye. And I'm not this time he's blowing smoke up his hole because like, I know he's an absolute <laughs> fucking tyrant otherwise. But like, as a coach, I think he's fucking so good. Yeah. And uh, like, you, as you said, you I think if you're somebody that can put yourself out there, like put, do your lifts in front of other people and be an open book to that, to be being saying, oh, maybe I could do this better. Abs is a great place to be. Yeah, absolutely. And you mentioned Jay there, you know, he kept my head sort of screwed on. Recently enough, I was, you know, saying to him, I was like, oh, can we 
implement more, you know, singles to my program and then more volume work mm. and everything else. Um, and he was like, he was like, why do you want to do that? And I was like, I don't know. Because we can <laughs> yeah. all, we're always looking for ways to improve, even though things might be going perfectly. Yeah. You know, we've added lots of kilos onto my total in the last year. He said, this is why I haven't changed too much in your programming recently because, mm. you know, things are going perfectly the way they are. If it isn't broke, if it ain't broke, don't, don't fix, fix it. it. Yep, 100%. And th I've had these conversations with him before. And it's even, do you know what I, I was very surprised by? How much he pays attention to without you even knowing. Like, he, I was talking to him about what I was doing and he's like, you're doing too much fucking volume. You're doing too much fucking leg volume and that's where your knees are starting to fucking hurt because you were cutting last year for Westerns and you didn't drop your volume. I was like, how do you know? Is it because I watch you every week? And I was like, every time I looked over, you weren't watching. I was like, but I watched your sets while you were doing them. So he does pay attention and like that, he'll always have a logic behind what he's doing. And that's a perfect example of why, as you mentioned, it's important to work with a coach because we can get, as lifters, we get notions. You know, yeah. Oh, I'm making improvements, but what if I can make more if yeah. I just change this arbitrary thing? Well, having somebody to kind of bring you back to you're improving, things are going well. Like I'd say you're all set now. Like, so look, your next comp's Western Euros. Yeah. I'd say you're all set to break 800 kilos plus. Oh, I fucking hope so. I'd say, I'd say so. <laughs> no, do you know I, I, well, I'm confident I can as well. Yeah. Do you know the only variable I think we're all going to have to deal with, man? Because one of my lifters over there now for Junior Worlds, the heat, it's like 30 plus degrees. Yeah, just, just hydrate well. You know, and fucking, yeah, just to anyone going international comps uh, or even just on a normal comp, they try not to deviate too much from your food, mm. uh, your usual food, because we can go over there and start eating all the great food that's there on offer in the days prior to the comp. But, oh. uh, that can fucking mess you up big time. You don't want your zone. stomach, you don't, you don't want to, uh, yeah, you don't want to be leaky goat or anything when you're mm. going out to fucking squat heavy. So what are the goals for Westerns? The goal, I'd say, well, you know, it's go 9-9. Win. You know, hit some PVs. Win. You know, I, no, I've looked at the the, the roster. You know, I, I don't think winning is, you know, unless they have a fucking really bad day. But I've seen some of the guys, some of the Britain, British guys, they're near 900 kilo total. So mm. it is about being realistic as well. But no, I'm just going to enjoy it, man. Yeah. You it's know, your first I, cap. Yeah, absolutely, man. I'm going to, you know, have a great time. Enjoy. Take it all in. Wear that singlet mm. with pride. Try hit some PVs as well. You know, that's always the goal with powerlifting. It's just to progress, hit some PBs. Mm. If I can get a 300 squat, great. Um, You know, maybe 185 to 190 bench, happy days. And then deadlift probably in the region of six reds, hopefully. So Amazing, man. That would be very good. I'd be happy with those. Some big milestone numbers, you know. Running your own race. And that's it, man. And this is the big thing. You know, you can get caught up comparing yourself to the lifters who are better than you in the country or mm. in the world or you know, who are lifting 100 kilos more than you in lower A classes. But at the end of the day, if you want long-term progression, you have to find the areas that you need mm. to improve on yourself. And yeah. this is where you're going to see that long-term progress. Yeah, I mean, I think, like, as you said, comparison is this big thing in this sport because it's yeah. such a binary thing. Weight on the bar, how much you squat, bench, and deadlift. Uh, what your body weight is. These are such binary things. And there is that, and people use it. Like they say, well, they're lighter than you, they lift more. It's like, the question then becomes, how long are they lifting? That's is this it. person a freak in their weight class? You yeah. know what I mean? Like, uh, if you look at, say, do you know Adam Duan from yes. Phenom? <laughs> Amazing lifter. But, like, it's him. in the 83s, it was him and Calum Matney before he moved up. And everybody else is, like, 50 to 100 kilos below them. Yeah. They're just that good. You know what I mean? Like, And that's it's the same thing in the... In, if we look at the 93s, for a long time, it was Keen and everybody else. Now there's a few can like Matt Henry's amazing, Aaron Blackmore's amazing. Obviously, yeah. Damian Nam's come up and kind of he's looking the best at the moment. Uh, but the you've got to look at where the average is. You know what I mean? And I think it's it's that for a lot of lifters. It's like you could be doing amazing. You're just comparing yourself. Like if you're an 84 plus, maybe don't compare yourself to Listus. You know what I mean? Because yeah. she's unbelievable. If you're a 76, maybe don't compare yourself to Emma McDermott because Emma's yeah. work, Emma's world class. You just look at the other averages in the in the scene and aim to just income like that. I've talked about it before. I've probably posted about it a bunch online. Don't try to outlift people right now. Just outlast them. Most people leave. That's it, man. Most people leave this sport, man. That's yeah. That's that's huge as well. You yeah. know, I look at most of the people who are better than me mm. uh, right now. And a lot of them, or all of them, have been around a lot longer than I have, you yeah. know. So, you know, when you put it in that sense, you know, I'm not doing too bad. And when you can look at it from that lens, you can take, you know, more pride in yourself hitting PBs. Yeah. That way you'll enjoy the process and you will stick around for longer, which will lead to 
the better results long term. I think it mu- I'd say it's bizarre for some people to listen though to hear you talk about that because you're like you know you're edging towards that 800 kilo total. You're you're able to yeah. rep 300 plus deadlifts and people are like this motherfucker like you know what I mean <laughs> like this motherfucker out here saying like I'm comparing myself to people and he's like one of the best in the country. You know what I mean? I think that's like where you mi- like think about it. And this is what I, I say to anyone whenever it comes to like because one uh, one of my girls is doing junior euros and she's like I just don't want to come last. Right? I'm like. You've been invited to junior euros. You're one of the best junior lifters That's in the country. Man, yeah. Think about it. Like you could go, you could go to an international and come last. But think how many lifters in this country want to just get their first cap. Like think about how many lifters in the country just want to qualify for nationals. Yeah. That alone then go on to lift internationally. If you're able to get an era singlet, whether it's worlds, euros, Western euros, you've set yourself apart from a massive uh, like pool of athletes. So yeah, you could be the bottom of the list. But you're still on the fucking list. And it's the same principle if you dial it all the way back to competing. Because sometimes you've probably heard this before yourself. Oh, uh, like I need to get a bit better before I compete. Or I need to lift heavier before I compete. It's like by competing, you're already way ahead of everyone else that doesn't compete. Yeah. So I think it's a massive mindset shift. Like I know for, like you mentioned, it's hitting your own personal bests. I know for me, for Westerns, I just want to do better than I did at Westerns last year. Because I kind of stuck up the place a little bit, right? But that's <laughs> the goal for me. If I go in and do better than I did at Westerns last year, I don't care what else I do. No. Mm. No, absolutely, man. Yeah, it's it's running your own race essentially, and I think everyone gets caught up in the comparison thing. It's it can be the same as well with the whole body composition thing. I noticed this in powerlifting as well. People, they, you know, they don't feel too good, especially when you're seeing all these, you know, shredded influences online. Yeah. The same sort of thing. You're comparing yourself to people lifting more than you. You're comparing yourself to people who may, you know, look a lot leaner and more muscular than you. Um, but no, just yeah, run your own race, man. You know. Here, speaking of aesthetics and all, do you know your man Sean Fitzness? Sean Fitzpatrick. Sean Fitzness, he's a yeah. unit. He's, he's a huge guy. He lifted at USAPL. I, I seen he did a comp there recently. Yeah. Like, like fair play to him for signing up. I think he should do another one. But uh, like, if you look at the way he looks and how big, because he's really tall as well. He's a yeah. big dude. His lifts weren't amazing. Decent enough bench, you know. Yeah, his bench is very good. He probably just didn't, hasn't devoted that much time to the skills of squatting and deadlifting as well. You know? so, no, 100%. This is not me shitting on him. I'm just using that as a prime example of like, yeah. there's somebody who is like, obviously aesthetically like, probably ad- ad- admirable. There's probably people that envy that type of physique. But then on the flip side of that, he doesn't have that same performance as somebody who has committed to this. And it's kind of attributes, isn't it? Like you're going to get better at what you aim to max out at. So like if you're putting all your stats in strength, you're not going to have the aesthetic stat. You know what I mean? That's quite as high if you think about like in like an RPG. You know, so that's the way I kind of think about it. You know what I mean? So uh, like that's just a prime example of that. But here, let me ask, because I don't want to keep you here for way long because we're shy talking nearly 80 minutes. Uh, <laughs> you're leaving the country. I'm leaving the country. I'm going traveling. So... This is a big thing for me when when Ben reached out to me to join the the Better Man Project as a coach. So myself and my uh, girlfriend, we planned to travel for a long time um, and since during even COVID, you know, and the big thing that sort of deterred us from doing that was the fact we had jobs and we wanted to also save up for a mortgage as well. Mm -hmm. And if you're, you know, leaving your job to go travel, you're just burning through cash and not putting money away for a house. Mm -hmm. Um, But now, you know, we're, we're both online coaches now as well. So uh, we're able to do that and mm. essentially work from anywhere in the world, which is, you know, a fantastic opportunity. Um, yeah. And yeah, it's something I take great pride in and I'm, I'm very, very happy that I can do. Um, so yeah, going to Dubai. Mm-hmm. Um, she also has family in Qatar because mm-hmm. her cousin flies for Qatar Airways. Mm-hmm. Um, then, so we'll be spending a bit of time there as well between before Dubai and after. Mm-hmm. Then we're going on to Australia where I'll get to meet up with uh, Abdullah and Connor in mm-hmm. Melbourne. Probably trained them. It looks like Connor has a new uh, 9 a.m. crew down under, which is which Good is sad. Man, Connor. Yeah, <laughs> you can't be in abs. Bring abs with you. That's it, man. And uh, yeah, look forward to going down there, seeing them, catching up, and then then we're going on to Asia. So that will be tricky to to navigate with, you know, the whole celiac disease as well, and yeah. uh, and powerlifting as well. You know, yeah. I'm there is a part of me that I'm worried. I'm like, fuck, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna regress my lifts and everything else. But you know, I know from experience and from seeing you know, other lifters who have taken long layoffs, Mm -hmm. like, um, you know, Jack Kenny's a good example. Yeah. Apparently he, you know, quit to play hurling for a while, Mm -hmm. came back, fucking. Not a bother to him. Largest ever told in the IPF. (laughs) Yeah. Or Irish PF, I'd say. Um, Then you have Colin Power, bad boy, except there, who's come back stronger than ever. He's an animal, man. Yeah. Yeah. And like, you know, I I see them and I, you know, take great inspiration from even Jake Brennan, you know, a couple of weeks ago, you know, back to it, 979 total, you know, so. First deadlift PB in five years savage man yeah. yeah unreal 
Is so. so is that the plan then? You're going like how long are you traveling for? The probably the guts of a year, you know, it could right. be shorter, it could be longer. We we don't know yet, but we have, you know, just the first sort of couple of months planned out, you know. We're we'll be in Dubai for a few months. So we'll have a good base there. I'll be able to, you know, tip away training and everything else. Mm. But um yeah, it'll get a bit trickier when we get to Asia. So. But the goal is to still do powerlifting training. Absolutely. Do you think they'll try and compete when you're abroad? I was thinking about this as well. You know, ah, what, do it, man. I, like if we, sick. if we get some, you know, IPF affiliate comp, that'd be mm. cool. But um, you know, it's just whether I want to or if I'm in a good place to, you know, I, yeah. I want everything to be going There's really a lot of well. Variables, yeah. yeah, and like I, I plan to cut down now, mm. like lose a good bit of body fat because I know then the off season after that is going to be great. Then once I'm in a you know solid position to gain some size mm. again, um, so yeah, I want to do that. Have a lengthy off season because that's where I've actually made the most progress is yeah. by having long, long off seasons like the COVID training in my mate's back gardens. Yeah. And then um, between like, for example, when I joined ABS and when I did my first comp, so I joined in the April, didn't compete until the December. Yeah. Then I did nationals in February 23. That's right. Didn't compete again until November. So I like having those lengthy mm. off seasons to, you know, build a lot of base with volume. Jay always tells me this as well. So it's, it's the volume that's going to, over time, that's going to build the total. So mm. that's, that's what I would want to aim at before consider competing again. So just to, for anyone that's wondering and that's just heard for the first time that you're going to be mo moving away, you are ultimately going to come back. Yeah, I know. Yeah. We definitely will be back, you know, unless <laughs> we find somewhere we absolutely love. But yeah, yeah. You now all, all my family and friends are here and, uh, you know, my dog as well. Oh, well, I'm obviously, yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah, so. Yeah, it was a tour because that happened, obviously, we had that a couple of years ago when Shane left and he moved to Spain during COVID. Then he moved to Canada. He's back in Spain, I think, now. But, uh, because he was such an integral part of abs for a while as well. So yeah. it's always tough because like I will say that definitely over the past couple of years, you've become one of those really prominent figures. Like the, just like Connor did. Like yeah. I remember when I started and Connor was like 18, man. You know, he grew up with powerlifting, you know. It was it was really, it was shit to see him and Lada leave. And it is shit when like, like yourself, you're obviously going to be gone. It's cool that you'd be traveling, but you can always see a, it's a little piece of like what makes like the sessions good is like, Somebody that's good crack to buzz off, or like good a good training partner. I always yeah. say that about Connor. He's such a great training partner. Yeah, he's savage. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that it's it's obviously sad to see you go, but hope you have an absolute blast doing it, and hopefully, uh, you know, you you enjoy the experience. Hopefully, you don't get too sunburned in some of those places. No, I'm, I'm yeah, I'm prone to sunburn. Yeah. Man. I need to get my moles checked as well. Yeah. Uh, do you know? Then I suppose that the the last thing I say to you is that what's the crack? Then a few people listen are probably like, right, I need to get fucking blood work done. I need to sort out my nutrition. I'm gonna text Ryan McCann. What's the story? Best place for them to get you to sign up for powerlifting nutrition? Abs nutrition. Abs sure. nutrition is the pathway forward. And what if it's somebody who just wants to get jacked a bit? So they better off going through Better Man Project then? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah so, all right. Uh, Connor's going traveling. Not Connor. Jesus. Ryan's going traveling. <laughs> Let's give him some goddamn business here. He's going to, you know, he's going to be living it up, eating some nice food, hopefully not too much gluten. Man, I'm really happy we actually got to record this because uh, I, now that I, I obviously knew you were leaving, but it's something I've been plaguing you for. So thanks for coming on and giving some good insights into not just your own journey, but also like nutrition in general. I think there's definitely some more talking points there, but uh, I'm sure if anyone has any questions, they can reach out to you on Instagram. No, absolutely. Yeah. Thanks very much for having me on, man. It's been a pleasure. And it's, it's cool to finally see the Primal Studios as well. So Amazing, man. No, thanks very much. Thank you. Good yes. man.